So good evening, everyone. My name is Andrea Roncella. I am a postdoc in corporate and sustainable finance at the University of Siena. And uh, I'm also one of the coordinators of the Finance and Humanity Village at the Economy, at the economy of Francesco. So I'm really honored uh, to introduce to you our guest for uh, today's webinar. Uh, Alex Edmonds uh, is a professor of finance uh, at the London Business School. Even though it's the first time uh, I met him, uh, even uh, virtually, uh, I can say to be an avid reader of his works, uh, which are very much focused uh, on how to reform uh, business uh, to serve uh, the common good. So Alex, as you know, the economy of Francesco is a process uh, which is uh, gathering uh, and involving many young people, many young people from all over the world, with the aim to change how the economy works. Uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, this topic nowadays, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic made this uh, uh, made this challenge even stronger and more urgent. However, we can uh, we can say that. Uh, uh, it may happen that not all uh, the proposals uh, to pursue this goal uh, of change uh, uh, the economy are actually good uh, or are actually supported uh, by strong evidence. So the reason uh, for why uh, I think, I believe that today's webinar can be extremely useful and extremely important for us is that uh, Alex Edmonds uh, combine both provocative uh, thought, provocative ideas, and academic rigor, and evidence supported by data. Uh, so he made many proposals of reforms, like for example, how to translate uh, purpose into action, how to restructure CEOs and executive compensation in order to promote uh, stakeholder value, how to put the profit uh, at the service of society, and uh, how, for example, to overcome the net present value when uh, judging and assessing uh, an investment decision. And uh, in, ma in making these proposals, uh, he's always uh, tried to, 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 to make the, this proposal supported by strong evidence. So in doing so, I think that he combines what uh, Pope Francis uh, uh, called us to do, to be both uh, ambitious and concrete, uh, ambitious and concrete. Uh, so, Alex, I'm really very, really glad uh, that you accepted our our invitation, and really honored to present you. Uh, before to leave you the screen, uh, I will remember just a few just a few details, technical details. So, first of all, that uh, the link for the registration form. Uh, will be posted uh, both on the YouTube and Zoom chat, uh, so you can enroll yourself. Uh, then there, there will be uh, some Q&A at the end of the discussant uh, intervention. We are going to have three discussants after Alex's speech. And then there, there will be uh, also translation both in Portuguese and, uh, and Spanish available on the YouTube chat. There will be the link. Uh, so, Alex, the screen is yours. Thanks again for being us uh, uh, for being here with us today. Thanks. Well, oh, thank you so much, Andrea, for that generous introduction. And it's a huge pleasure to be here. Now, I know that everybody says, "Oh, it's a pleasure" when they start a talk, 
But I want to stress that this is just not perfunctory for me. I, I'm really excited for the giving this address because I speak a lot to companies, but I think it's the future leaders of this world, which is you, which really need to change this idea of, of where, why businesses exist. And yes, I do get to address a future leaders as I teach at London Business School, but those are only people based in London, whereas the challenge of repurposing finance for the common good is a global challenge. So it's great to have future leaders from all across the world and also as a lifelong Christian it's really nice to be involved in the economy of Francesco something so closely supported by Pope Francis and also as Andrea says that this is something I've done a lot of research in so throughout my whole research career I focused on finance as a common good but I also want to stress this is not just a topic of research for me it's something that I passionately care about and hopefully this will come across in the talk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by purpose. So the subtitle of my talk is Reconciling Purpose and Profit. But I think a good place to start is explain what I mean by purpose. And you might think, well, that sounds obvious, but actually I might have a slightly different view of purpose than what you might think. And to do this, let me give you a story and let me actually take you on a little bit of a journey. I'd like to take you away from your home offices and your laptop screens to a little bit of a journey halfway around the world. So I'm going to take you to the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents and 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon and Asia to Mozambique and Africa. And it has some of the world's highest mountains like this one, but it also has some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi which is in the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. Now, you might think it's hard to imagine that you're here because you haven't seen it before. But in fact, some of you might have seen it before, not on the small screen of your laptop, but maybe on the big screen of a movie theatre. It was featured in The Constant Gardener, which was a blockbuster movie that came out about 15 years ago. And indeed, millions of people around the world have seen this lake because they've seen this movie. But fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes a living selling goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be that everything he did was with cash. When he sold a goat, he would receive cash, but then he'd have to check that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and worry about it being stolen, and then to bank that cash. It wasn't just walking down to the town centre. He had to trek for one entire day to go to the bank. So his life was really difficult. He couldn't graze his goats on the greenest pastures. He had to always be within one day of a bank. But all of that changed due to a purposeful business. And this purposeful business was Vodafone. So they are the main telecoms company within the UK. And so in 2007, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. So let me explain what mobile money is, because people think it's mobile banking. Right? I have a bank account and I can operate it on my phone. I don't need to go down to the branch. But with mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that's really important because 15 million Kenyans had no access to banking. So this completely transformed Emmanuel's life. He no longer needs to deal with cash. He doesn't need to worry about forgery or robbery. He can graze his goats where he wants to. And he has a record of every transaction on his phone. But we don't just care about one single anecdote. As Andrea said, I try to base what I'm saying on large scale research. And indeed, there was a large scale study by some professors at MIT which found that within the first seven years of the launch of M-Pesa, 200,000 households got lifted out of poverty. And many of these households were headed up by women. It allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail, so there was a large effect on gender equality. So that's one story I'm gonna tell you about Vodafone. But now I'm gonna tell you a quite different story. And this different story surrounds tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first telecoms company around the world 
to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they are paying to governments around the world. And that's really important because in telecoms, you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax countries. So I've got two questions for everybody here to think about. So the first is which of these decisions, M-Pesa or tax transparency, created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worsened Vodafone's ESG rating or reputation, where ESG means environmental, social, and governance. I'm not going to poll anybody, right? We're going to have a lot of time at the end for questions and discussion. And also why I'm not going to poll anyone is I'm pretty sure that most people would agree with the answers. Which decision created most value for society? It was the first one, right? By launching m -Pesa, Vodafone lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and contributed to gender parity. But let me now move to the second question. What would have been the public outrage if Vodafone had not launched m -Pesa? It would have been nothing. Right? You don't get slammed by the media for not launching an innovation. There would not have been a customer boycott for not coming up with this idea of banking without a bank because nobody would have expected you to do that anyway. But what is the outrage for not being transparent upon ta about tax? It could be massive. And indeed, Vodafone themselves had suffered a nationwide boycott of their stores a couple of years earlier. So this is why my view of purpose is slightly different to what you typically hear. So absolutely, purpose does involve the second question. Do no harm, right? Don't cheat on taxes. Don't pollute the environment. Don't mistreat your workers. That is all important. That's all part of a purposeful company. But I am saying that is not enough. Right? If we want to transform society, it is not enough for a company to just do no harm. You also need to actively do good. Right? Given the challenges that the world faces in 2021, let's say it's inequality, it's climate change, it's automation, the threats of technology, all of those things require active action, not just the failure to just avoiding bad things. So this is why I would like to change our thinking about purpose. Yes, part of it is not doing bad things, but let's think about how much good can we actively do? And that might involve launching some crazy ideas like a telephone company getting involved in banking and money. And so this is what the talk is about, inspiring, creative, innovative ways to try to serve society. And so this is linked to a framework that I introduced uh, in a recent book. So we often think that the value that a company creates is given by a pie. And that pie can be shared either with investors in the form of profits, that's the blue, or society in the form of wages to workers or taxes to the government or fair prices to customers, and that's the orange. And often we think that purpose and the common good is about splitting the pie more fair. So giving up some profits to pay your workers more. And absolutely that is part of it, right? We need to make sure that there's fairness and equality. But what I like to do is to change our thinking and say fairness and equality is not enough. Companies must do more than that. Why? So it's for two reasons. So the first reason is if purpose is just about splitting the pie differently, then many chief executives won't want to do it, right? Because purpose makes your company less profitable. And I'm sure many of you know that two years ago, 181 CEOs in the US signed the business roundtable statement saying they're going to serve wider society, but many of them haven't put it into practice. And you might think, well, why would they? If purpose means my company is going to be less profitable, let me not do this. The second reason why purpose can't just be about splitting the pie differently is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people like to portray investors as nameless, 
faceless capitalists. Investors are them, society is us. If we take from them and give to us, then that's good. But what I like to stress is that investors are not them. They are us. Right, they include parents saving for their children's education, pension funds saving for retirement, the church saves a lot of money and invests that, and that's to fund uh, their future activity. Right, so investors are a key part of society. Any repurposing of business must ensure that investors are able to get a return on their savings. So this is why my view of responsibility is that it's about growing the pie. It's about actively creating value. Yes, we do want to increase the orange, but the way we do that is not by giving them a greater slice of what's already there, but coming up with these innovative, crazy ideas, like using your telecoms expertise to solve the problem of financial inclusion in Kenya. And the beauty of this is that when Vodafone did this, they genuinely did not launch m to make money. Back in 2007, their strategy was to expand in the West and to win Spectrum license auctions. Instead, they thought, well, let me just try to develop m because it's the right thing to do. And eventually, they were able to monetize it and profit from it, which is why the blue increases, but it was something which was motivated by serving society and solving this massive problem of financial lack of inclusion. Now, at this point in my talk, you might think everything I said sounds great, but going back to Andrea's introduction, where is the evidence, right? It's just too good to be true. I'm saying if companies serve society, magically profits will go up. But how do we know that's the case? Might it be that if you're serving society, you're making less money? So this is why my main job as a business school professor is to look at large scale evidence. And the important thing here is to make sure that the evidence is rigorous, which was something else that came across in Andrea's introduction. Why? Because of this idea of confirmation bias which is we have our existing views on the world. And if we see some evidence which supports our view, we will believe it even if the evidence is weak. And this is particularly a problem for purpose and profit. We would like to believe that serving society does make you better off. And so if a study was to claim that, then we might believe it even if that study is weak. And so I gave a TED talk a couple of years ago called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World about the importance of being rigorous with evidence. So let me just give you one example of this as it applies to today's topic of purpose and profit and finance for the common good. I'm going to take a, an article by Forbes. That's a respected news outlet. And there was an article which said that companies that excel in their sustainability outperform their peers financially. Now, there's nothing wrong with that statement. That's just reporting what a study finds. But here is the problem. That is the premise of a new report, and it is an accurate one, judging by many conversations with those interested in better business, better corporate governance, and a sustainable future. So how did the journalist judge whether the report was accurate? Not by looking at its scientific rigor, not by looking at the methodology, but just by asking people who were already interested in better business, do you think that this study is accurate? And obviously they would say. Right, so we need to be much more rigorous than that. We can't just rely on wishful thinking. And so this is something that I started 15 years ago when I did my PhD uh, back at MIT. I wanted to look at, does purpose actually lead to profit or does it just mean that the company is distracted from the bottom line? Now, the big challenge here is how do we measure whether a company is purposeful? You might think, well, can't we look at the, the purpose that they state? Some companies might say my purpose is to make money. Another company might say my purpose is to provide healthy and enriching workplaces for my employees. But you can't just look at that because some companies might just say some nice things and not actually deliver on. 
So what I wanted to do is not to look at what companies say, but what companies do. Now, if you think, well, we're going to look at what companies do, you might think, well, why don't we look at how much the company spends on reducing its carbon footprint or how much they spend on their workers? But the important thing here is that sometimes you might spend a lot of money, but not actually create a lot of value. And there's a lot of great things that you can do that don't actually cost anything. So think of the best managers that you've had at work, right? Those are people that mentor you, that give you interesting work, that they take you to meetings. That doesn't cost any money, but it's something which is really great and just makes the job fun. So rather than looking at how much they spend, I wanted to look at a measure of output. Now, purpose involves lots of different parts of society, right? We care about employees, we care about customers, we care about communities, we care about the environment and so on. I chose to focus on employees. Now, why did I choose to focus on that? For two reasons. So first is that employees are important in every organization. Whereas with the environment, well, I do care a lot about climate change, but that might matter for an energy company. It might not matter so much for a technology company because you don't have as much of an impact in the environment. Whereas for every company, employees, the human element is absolutely critical. So that was one reason. And the second reason why I looked at employees is I had a very good measure available of employee well-being. And this is the list of the 100 best companies to work for. Now, this list has been around since 1984. So I had 28 years of data. I stopped the study in 2011. So why is that so important? Well, this whole idea of purpose and finance for the common good is a pretty new phenomenon. And most measures of purpose have only been around for the last 10 years. So if I was to show you that I found that purpose paid off between 2010 and 2019, you might say, well, those were 10 great years for the stock market. Maybe purpose only does well in an upswing. Maybe right now in a downturn, in a pandemic, companies should not think about purpose, they should just think about survival. But because my data started in 1984, I had things like the financial crisis, I had the September the 11th, I had the collapse of the internet bubble, and so I could show that purpose pays off in bad times as well as good. Now there's a lot of challenges here, the main one being is it correlation or is it causation? Is it treating work as well? leads to more profit? Or is it if you are more profitable to begin with, then you can start treating your work as well? So I do a lot in the paper to address those concerns. I'm not going to bore you with all of those details. Instead, let me get to the punchline, what this means for you as future leaders of this world. And what I found was that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period, that's 89 to 184% cumulative. Right, so this I think is striking because what it shows is that companies that treat their work as well actually do better in financial terms. So the case for purpose is not only a moral case and an ethical case, those cases are important, but we want to treat our work as well as human beings, but there's also a business case. Well, it's just good business sense. So even if you are a narrow-minded, hard-hearted finance person, right, you should still want to invest in your employees because it makes your business more successful and more sustainable in the long term. So my final 12 minutes or so, let me talk about how do we put this into practice? Well, I've told you it's important for companies to serve society. How do we actually do this? I think the most important thing here is to just think about, again, what it means for a company to be purposeful. So we often think that the word purpose is a synonym for altruism. Right? A purposeful company serves wider society. Maybe you serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, and communities and investors. Now, that sounds great, but it's unrealistic. Why? Because we have trade-offs. Right? So sometimes you will make some decisions that help some people and hurt others. So let's say you're an energy company and you're thinking of closing down 
a coal-fired power station. If you do that, that's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers because they'll be made redundant. So if your purpose was to serve workers and the environment, it's not going to help you make that decision. So if we go back to what the word purpose means, it actually means being focused and targeted. Why a purposeful meeting is a meeting with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, then I do it deliberately. And so what purpose means is we don't need to solve every single one of the world's problems, but we will just focus on a couple that we can solve really well. Like just like what is your purpose yourselves uh, uh, when you go into your careers? Like some, it might be to be a doctor or it might be to be an entrepreneur or a lawyer or a banker or a human rights activist, but you're going to choose to be one of those things. You're not going to choose to do everything. Right? And so what I define purpose is why a company exists. It's who it serves, its reason for being, and the role that it plays in the world. And the answer to this has to be targeted. Let me just give you a few pointers as to how to think about this. So why do you exist? Right, this is based on the idea of comparative advantage. You should do what you are good at. So for Vodafone, right, there's loads of challenges in the world that they could address. Right, There's climate change, there's racial diversity, there's gender parity and so on. They chose to solve financial inclusion, and by doing so, gender parity. Why? Because their expertise was telecom. So they chose to focus on that rather than just to react to whatever happens to be in the news. They chose to use their expertise in the way that it could create most fun. The second thing I like to think about is the who. So who do you want to serve? Yes, you'd love to serve everybody, but I mentioned the idea of trade-offs. And so this is linked to the idea of materiality. So what do I mean by materiality? Well, yes, there's loads of different stakeholders that matter for your business, but some might matter more than others. And so what I'm showing you here is the materiality map, which the Sustainability Accounting Standards Boards came up with. What they did is they went industry by industry to find out who are the most material stakeholders in your industry. For example, in mining, the environment is really important. Some of you will know the sad story of Rio Tinto blowing up Dukan Gorge, the ancient site in Australia that obviously had a massive impact on society and its reputation. But if you're a bank, maybe the environment is not as important because your direct effect on it is not as large. In fact, what matters much more are things like selling practices and product labeling. So there's a lot of banks that make money by confusing their customers and having a, the small print and so on. As a bank, what's so important for you is to be really transparent and fair, be absolutely top with customer privacy and data security. And so this is the final study that I'm going to show you. So what these people did is they looked at ESG data from MSCI, which is perhaps the best known data source. And they looked at companies that did well across the board. They did well in every dimension. And they found that they did not beat the market. Right? They only beat the market by one and a half percent. So if you serve environment, the employees, customers, suppliers, the government, everybody, you're actually not serving your shareholders. You're only beating it by an insignificant amount. But then they redid the study by looking at companies that did well on the material issues and did poorly on the immaterial issues. So they focus on the most material stakeholders and they found that they did outperform by 4.8% per year. So just reflect on that. What we like to hear the phrase, oh, purposeful companies always do better. There is no trade-off between purpose and profit. That's actually wrong, right? Only if you are purposeful in targeted and focused areas will you actually be more successful as a company. Just like you as a person, right? If you were accepting every opportunity to serve on the board of a charity and you end up serving on 30 charities, you're going to be no good for any of them. 
So let's perhaps serve them the three charities that I care most passionately about and most closely use my skill. So my final six minutes, let me think about how do we apply this to the crisis? So there's many people who said, oh, now that we are in a pandemic, companies cannot afford to think about purpose because they're just short of money. Now, there are some companies that have done some amazing things in the pandemic, which I will call pie splitting. They've given up part of the pie to help others. Some CEOs have cut their salary. Some companies are paying workers wages, even though the workers are furloughed. And some companies like Unilever are giving 100 million euros of food and sanitizer to customers and communities. Now, those actions are fantastic. But the problem is, is that many companies can't do that. They can't split the pie because they don't have pie to give. What if you don't have 100 million euros lying around? What if you're not in the food and sanitizer industry? So this is why I introduced my talk with the idea that responsibility is about growing the pie. It's about innovation and creativity and doing some things that don't cost much money, but just use the expertise that you have already in a creative way. So I believe, then any responsible business leader should ask herself, what is in my hand? What are the resources and what is the expertise that my company has? And how can I use this to serve wider society? And this can lead to some amazing things. For example, let's think of LVMH, right? They're a luxury perfumes company. Perfume is not really useful, everybody's staying at home, right? But what is their expertise? It's to manufacture things which are alcohol-based. Perfume is made with alcohol. Well, what else is made with alcohol? It's hand sanitizer. And so what they're now doing is just producing lots of hand sanitizer to help out. Let's think of Mercedes. Right? They make Formula One engines. Formula One does not help in a pandemic, but they've used the same engineering expertise to make breathing machines, actually a special type of breathing machine, which is less invasive than ventilators. And what about if you're a small company? Well, often people think, yeah, it's great for Unilever to give out 100 million euros, but I'm just a small company. So let me give you an example of a small company I'm a customer of. I actually went to them today. It's called Barry's Boot Camp. It is a gym. It's a brutal gym that people like David Beckham go to. Now, the gym was closed over the pandemic. So what did they do? Well, they gave free online fitness classes through Instagram, which was really important for people who were self-isolating at home. Now, you might think, well, that's not that innovative, like a fitness company offering fitness classes. But here's the really powerful thing. Like, what about the desk workers at the gym? They're the people who check you in when you go. Right now that the gyms are closed, what can they do? Well, what it turns out is that many of these desk workers are actors as their main job. But because acting is quite a volatile career, they took this desk job in order to provide them with some income stability. Now, if you're an actor, what is in your hand? You're really funny. Well, how does being funny help out in the pandemic? Well, what we had was a lot of working parents where their children were at home because the schools were shut. And so what they offered was a program of things like free Zoom storytelling sessions to the children to take the load off the working parents. So I think this is really powerful, right? This shows how even a small company and somebody who is a desk worker is able to really help out at the crisis by thinking about what is their expertise. And so obviously the pandemic has been really bad, but if there's a small silver lining from the crisis, it's to rethink our notion of purpose. It's not just about spending money, it's thinking creatively about how we can use your skills. And I think this can also apply just post the pandemic. This is my penultimate slide. And it also applies to even junior people. So you might think, well, when I start my career, I'm not going to be the CEO. I can't decide to give 100 million euros to customers. But let's think about what I did when, when I started my career. I was an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. I started right at the bottom. I was an analyst. I thought nobody works for me. I have no control. But I realized that some people did work for me. My secretary, 
my IT department, the print room, and perhaps the most abused department in an investment bank is the graphics department. So what happens is you give them like some scribbles of paper and you ask them to turn this into some nice PowerPoint slides. And often the analyst would shout at the graphics department because they didn't do what they asked, even though it was often the analyst's fault by giving them something which was so complicated to begin with. Now, there were times when I got some good work back from graphics and I would call them up and I'd say, hi, this is Alex. Um, somebody did a job for me. Who was it? They would say, oh, that was Juliet. I said, can you put me through to Juliet? And they did. And I said, hi, Juliet, this is Alex. I want to say you did a great job. Right? Everything that I did, you, I asked you did. And you even did some things I didn't even ask for. Now, I didn't say that to sort of get a reputation for being nice. I just said it to say thank you. But because I was so junior, I didn't have my own office. I sat in the open plan floor. And because I had no office, everybody around heard me. And they started to do it themselves. And so that's how even in an investment bank, where the culture might be quite aggressive, the small action of saying thank you, that multiplied and then other people started saying thank you as well. And so before I hand over to the questions, um, as I was mentioned, I released a book about this last year. And the reason why I wrote that book is I think for far too long, people thought that purpose was something that a finance or business person should not want to care about because it's just costly. It's at the expense of profit. It's going to make the company bankrupt. But I wanted to argue, no, purpose is not only moral and ethical and good for society, it's good for the success of the business as well. And this is not based on just wishful thinking, but a lot of rigorous evidence and a lot of case studies and examples to put this into practice. So I hope this might be a resource to any of you uh, wanting to implement purpose in the careers that you uh, go on into or already in. Again, thank you so much for the invitation. It was great to be here. And let me just hand back to Andrea to um, go through um, to, to, to moderate the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for your uh, talk. Uh, it was very inspiring. Uh, and I can just say that uh, I will also suggest to, 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 to read a book, which I found uh, particularly interesting uh, because it delves into many, many case studies and many, uh, well, even may, a lot of academic research, but explain in a very simple way, I would say. So um, without taking... Uh, uh, much more time, I will leave the floor uh, to the first of our discussion today uh, with Noemi. Uh, sorry, Noemi, please. Hello to everyone. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Emens, um, for your very interesting presentation. Um, in my working group within Economy of Francesco, we dealt with um, similar questions, actually. Um, we challenged the profit and stakeholder value maximization theory and discussed um, alternatives. Um, therefore, it's a great opportunity and honor to enter into dialogue with you today. Um, first of all, I'm really grateful that you are introducing your concept in the world of finance and of businesses. And um, I'm more... I'm really convinced that we need such new thinking. Um, and I consider the shift from profit to purpose um, as crucial for today's world and for today's economy. Um, and I agree on many things, but fortunately I also have some uh, discussion points. If not, it would be quite boring, I guess. Um, my um, questions probably are influenced by my own background. Um, I'm a theologian and an economist, and for the moment, um, I'm a PhD student um, at University of Lucerne in Switzerland, and I'm addressing a theme within the domain of financial ethics. Um, uh, the first question will be more philosophical or abstract, probably, and um, then I will follow with some practical and economic ones. Um, my first question addresses the central um, term of purpose. Um, I think you explained really well what um, purpose means um, for you or and with what purpose means um, within uh, your research. Um, I anyway have a question um, from ethical point of view. Um, who is the one who defines the purpose of the 
corporation? Is it the management? Is it the investors? Who is it? Um, and then are there any ethical benchmarks to define what a meaningful purpose could be? Can it be everything <laughs> or is there some limits? Um, and actually who is defining ethical benchmarks for purposeful companies? Um, then in the reading um, in your um, book and also in some other um, writings, I have understood that you closely relate the purpose of a corporation um, as well as this growing pie mentality to the notion of social value. Um, and I understood that social value means, I think, that all parties um, benefit, like, for example, transforming customers' life for the better, healthy and enriching work, workplaces, places, et cetera. Um, but anyway, do you have some some concrete definition, what is social value and who defines what value is? Um, because I think that can vary a lot um, around the world. Um, and then these two questions, so uh, purpose and uh, social value, leads me to the next notion, um, to the concept of the growing pie, because as I read your text, I was wondering, what is the pie being made of? Is it, is it only monetary wealth or is it the realization of human rights for everyone? Or is it clean rivers for indigenous people in the Amazon region or elsewhere? Um, and can we account for the way the pie is made grown? Is, it, is the pie made grown in an ecological friendly way by respecting the human rights of everyone, um, et cetera. So those questions were quite philosoph philosophical, I think, um, but I also have some um, more practical one. Um, I really agree on the concept. Um, however, I doubt a little bit about the realization. Um, I just wanna hear again, how is it possible to really change the business culture and what role can the management play to help a corporation um, find its purpose and then to realize it? Um, and my last point, my last question, I also read that, um, and I think justifiably, um, you stress that regulation leads to compliance, but that we need more, namely commitment. Um, and I agree on that point. However, I do not necessarily think that regulation and commitment need to be opposites. Um, I think that they need to go hand in hand um, because regulation leads to legal um, accountability and commitment without willingness to be held accountable loses, in my opinion, credibility. Um, this conviction is shaped by a political discussion in Switzerland um, where we voted some months ago a bill on a bill which wanted to hold multinational corporations based in Switzerland accountable for human rights violation. And um, the multinationals and their representatives were heavily against the bill, even though they assured that their commitment to human rights is huge. Um, and the experience of those political discussions eroded a little bit my confidence that commitment alone is enough. So my last question, how can we make sure that commit, commitment is more than nice words? Um, and how can we make sure that commitment is translated into fair political and legal structures. So thank you very much again for your talk and for your time. You're very welcome, Noemi. And, and Andrea, I know I, in, I said at the start I was going to answer the questions one by one. I actually think it might be best to gather all of the questions because I think Noemi's raised a lot of interesting issues. And so I fear that if I answer them all, there, won't, there might not be enough time for the others. So it may well be that there's some overlapping themes in what they say. So might, I might actually take, take all of the questions and then I will just um, try to unify them in, in my response. Absolutely, absolutely. So please, Kyle, if you... Can keep going. Thing. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Um, and, and again, I really appreciate um, your, your your definition or your framing of, of the, uh, the word purposeful, especially in enterprise. Um, I'm coming from the lens of a practitioner. I run a venture capital firm focused on frontier technologies, solving big global challenges. So I play a lot earlier. A lot of your examples 
were quite interesting, especially studying um, larger incumbent enterprises like Vodafone. Um, how, how does um, your approach and your framework apply to earlier stages, um, the ideation and origination of in, uh, technology, product solutions, um, when purpose by your definition may not have been clearly defined? Again, you know, something coming out of a laboratory may still be identifying product market fit. So a lot of your, your definitions about purpose also correlate to some of the things that we see around product market fit. Um, and then how does that frame all the different things that contribute to that innovation, investment, um, you know, support networks, et cetera. So a lot of your examples were very much, very helpful looking at uh, historical companies, mostly larger incumbent enterprises. Uh, but I'd be interested in seeing how this approach uh, plays in the earlier stages when a lot of things are less defined. Great question. And, and yeah, I, 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 I'm really looking forward to discussing that. Um, yeah, so I'll go to, to the third. Please, Nicolas, if you can jump in. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, Professor. Thank you very much for the, for the lecture. Uh, very Welcome interesting to topic on the, on the book as well. Uh, so my question perhaps goes somehow along with what Noemi also asked. I'm based in Latin America in Brazil, and our groups in Economy of Francesco uh, have different uh, uh, topics which are covering uh, around the economy. And uh, one topic that I think is overlapping with uh, what you've just mentioned on the book uh, is, for instance, the power that people have to transform or to grow the, the pie. Uh, let's say not only the big leaders can, can make the change, but we can do the change as well as consumers, as uh, colleagues and the companies on where we work so on and so forth, uh, of course. And then my question is, how, ha, how can we translate uh, these concepts of the pie, the, grow, the pie growing mentality, uh, considering the context that we are living, especially in Latin America, if you could perhaps give some ideas of the developing, for the developing world, because what we, we've noticed and what we see in concrete actions, it, what is a pity, in fact, is that it is so common, the pie, let's say the pie splitting mentality. And it seems that we are heading to that direction uh, when we say that, for instance, uh, there's such a huge unemployment. So labor forces are, are driving for a, a huge reduction of salaries well, beyond, well below the minimum wage. Uh, and people, uh, even the spirit that we had uh, of solidarity among people which is like all the gratuity that we're we're offering to each other. Uh, what we've seen is that this is somehow somehow disappearing or reducing uh, at a very uh, very fast rate. So uh, and that's why I, I've seen that in Economy Francesco, our common topic is about regulation. Uh, we are discussing, for instance, taxation of dividends. For instance, uh, the uh, the, the necessity of establishing minimum wages even for a uh, specific segment and so on and which is not necessarily the, the the growing the pie as you mentioned so if you could translate this into our uh, developing world reality i would i would appreciate a lot thanks professor professor Great. Well, those are three great sets of, of, of comments, and I'm going to try to reply to as many of them as possible, and also to fold in some of the really good questions that we had in the chat. I'm going to start with Kyle's first, because I think that was clearly defined in terms of the, the importance for a startup, and that's a, 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 a nice standalone topic. And I actually think that while I did indeed use most of my examples from large public companies that was just because you have a lot of data on them so you have things like stock returns to measure performance which you don't have in a startup but i actually think there's even more power to be purposeful in a startup why one of the big challenges for a public company is you have lots of investors and often those investors have only a small stake in your company so they don't bother to look beyond things like short-term profits Whereas if you're a startup, well, most of the owners are actually the founders. And if you do have some outside venture capital financing, that venture capitalist has much more skin in the game, at least as a percentage of the overall firm value um, than, than you would do in a large public company. So um, fortunately, I have some slides on this. So uh, let me just give you an example of a startup that I know. Um, so before moving to London Business School, um, I was a professor at Wharton. Uh, and there was a student at Wharton called Dave Gilboa. Now you see him here wearing some glasses. 
but he didn't always have glasses because he actually lost his glasses, right? And the second year of his MBA at Wharton, he lost his glasses on a backpacking trip. And then to find, to buy a new pair of glasses, it was costing $300. And that was a lot of money for a student. And so he actually went for an entire term without any glasses squinting at um, the board. And he thought, well, this is crazy, right? Sight is such a basic human right. Why am I having to pay $300? And so what he chose to do was to, to set up an eyeglasses company. Um, actually, I, with, with a few other people. So these were two of his friends actually on the ice hockey team that I used to captain back at Wharton. That's me in the middle. And they started this company called Warby Parker. And uh, their, their mission was to offer a revolutionary eyewear at a crazy price. And so what was the crazy price? Well, the average price of glasses was 263. How much would you charge? Maybe 250, maybe 199. But they chose to offer a revolutionary price of just $95. And they also chose for every glass pair of glasses that they sold, that they would give one to somebody in a developing country. And that was something that a finance person like me would have never been able to justify with a net present value calculation. Yes, you think, yes, we should price at a discount to build a market share, but that would have never led you to charging something like this. And also the fact that people really cared about site just attracted a lot of employees to this and made uh, this a uh, company where loads of people were aligned around. And I think that's a nice segue to uh, the first of Noemi's really great question, which is who gets to decide on the purpose? Is it employees? Is it management? Is it um, investors? And I think it is all of them. And you might think, well, that's a bit of a cop out of the answer. But if a company has a clear purpose, which the CEO is stating, then indeed the investors that it will attract will be investors who care about that. And the employees will be ones who are also um, interested in that purpose, which is why I think it's so important for a purpose to be focused and targeted. Right? If you're saying my company's here to serve everybody, then it's not really clear who you stand for. But if I was to say my company's purpose is to provide sight and make this accessible and affordable, then there's a lot of people who might care about this. And so one example is Unilever, which is one of the most purposeful large public companies. And so when Paul Pullman says we're going to launch this sustainable living plan to make sustainable living commonplace, a lot of hedge funds sold the shares. And they got bought by a lot of long-term investors who cared much more about the long term. So that was a way in which you had investors buying into the purpose, because if you're clear about it, then the people who, who don't buy into that purpose, that's fine. They could just choose to leave and then other people will, will, will come in. And so you have this natural alignment. One of the other questions that you had, Naomi, and somebody else asked about spiritual capital um, in the chat is about what does the pie actually involve? And this is Ivan's question in the chat was, was around that. No, Amy specifically asked, is this about financial value? And the answer is no. So if I share my slides again, financial value or profit is only one small part of the pie. It is the blue. There's many other aspects of the pie, which is how you treat your workers. Are you delivering value to customers, including great products, customer service, not producing products that cause addiction like cigarettes and so on, the environment and so forth. And I think this is really important because when I talk about growing the pie, some people misunderstand me and they think, well, is he about growing profit or growing the firm? And we can't grow too much because we're going to just use up the resources. So there are some people who believe we should not have growth. So you might know the famous book, Donut Economics, saying we shouldn't grow too fast. While I do agree with some aspects of donut economics, I respectfully disagree with the idea that we should not grow because they have a narrow view of growth. Growth is not just in terms of finance, growth is in terms of human capital, right? So if you give workers enjoyable jobs with opportunities to step up and mentorship and training, there is no limit to how much you can grow the skills and the well being of your workforce. How can you grow environmental capital or natural capital that's coming up with new ways to um, make more with, with, with fewer resources, the whole idea of the circular economy? 
how do we grow customers, right? That makes sure that if we're making money, that's not contributing to customer addiction. Instead, it is using um, our expertise to solve social problems. So I think the idea, oh, let's not grow, I think that's problematic because that encourages people just to rest on their laurels and stick with the status quo, when in fact, given all of the problems in the world, let's think innovatively about how we can solve them. So growth is absolutely not just about financial capital. Another question um, that Noemi raised was, how do change managers views about this. And, and you're absolutely right, because a lot of managers are stuck in the idea that, well, they should just make money. And to do that, they should be extractive. But I think this is why a lot of my work is to show with evidence that actually a more purpose-driven approach is not only good for society, but it's also good um, for companies themselves. And so what is really great is since the book came out uh, about a year ago, um, the various companies that I've, I've, I've been speaking um, to uh, about are not the organizations that you might normally think. So, yes, it's not surprising that the economy of Francesco cares about purpose. But if you think about some of the other people I've spoken to, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and hedge funds and private equity and law firms, these ones are actually taking very seriously the idea of purpose. I'm working with some of these large, I'm not going to mention the specific names, but some of these large financial institutions who realize, no, we want to make money in a very different way. Like the way we've made money in the past might be through overworking our employees. It might be encouraging our clients to do deals that don't actually create value. There is going to be a different way of doing business. And so what I do think is that people realize this, not just from a moral point of view, but from a sustainability point of view, people will be walking away. Like McKinsey, we've seen how they've suffered a huge reputation loss for their role in Purdue Pharma. So I think power to change managers' views, part of this is through the evidence that it's really important for you um, as a business. Let me just skip a little bit to, to um, uh, some questions that Nicholas asked about the power of the people. And I'm really glad that you asked that because I think this is something I, it's really important. We have think that right now we've got giant, massive corporations. We as individual citizens, we can't do much because corporations are so bad. But I just gave the example of how me as a very junior employee at Morgan Stanley was able to do something pretty small. And what I'd like to stress is just the power of just small things. Right? If we go through our lives thinking, what can I do to make the world a little bit better? Then that can point to some, some great opportunities. So one of my friends is a lawyer. He's a mid-ranking lawyer. He's not massively rich. But he says, well, in the pandemic, what is in his hand is he does have some money. He doesn't have children yet. And so he went to his local coffee shop and said, can I advance purchase 100 coffees from you? I'm going to give you 300 pounds and give me a coffee card for 100 coffees. And that may have been the difference between that coffee company folding and that coffee company um, continuing. Similarly, um, the last church service that I went to before the lockdown, it was actually given by a vicar who was a doctor before he became a victor, vicar. And he says, well, if any of you end up being in hospital because you get sick or one of your relatives gets sick, just a small but genuine thank you to an overworked nurse or receptionist or doctor, that can have much more power. You might think, oh, words are not much, right? For finance people, we care about money, but small things like, like thank yous or thinking about what we can do make a, a big difference. Now, you talked about minimum wages, um, Nicholas, and I think this then links to another good point by Noemi about the role of regulation. So Naomi said, you think they go hand in hand. And actually, I fully agree. So the whole chapter 10 of my book is how there is an important role for regulation. So while I do indeed say companies should want to do it by themselves, they should do it with regulatory support. So I think the power of both of them working together is immense. And in particular, right, there's certain things that the government can do that companies can't. For example, the government can set a minimum wage. The government can set high taxes, and those taxes can help inequality. Because, yes, it's true that some equality comes from companies, but there's inequality from a lot of other sources. So it could be just rich, wealthy people who are able to inherit um, from their parents who own a lot of land or a lot of property. So I think the governments play a, a big role in here. The company should ensure that they don't influence the political process through things such as lobbying. And if so, then I think the power 
of com of regulators setting things like minimum wages and taxes, and then the companies playing by them, I think that's um, very powerful. Now, to get into a, a, a couple of, of, of things um, which uh, are, are in the, the chat. So there's another a number of comments um, by Abdullah. So I, I do appreciate the challenge here. I will actually just respectfully disagree with some of the points. So, so the point here is just saying companies are absolutely evil. It's absolutely not possible. They cannot do a good for the world. Corporations, investment banks, big tech, big pharma cannot. And I do understand why right, there are such companies that have created harm. And I start with the example of my book of, of Turing Pharmaceutical. But what is great about having these discussions is to have different viewpoints. And often the, the reality is neither black or white, but shades of gray. So we can have respectful disagreement, but what I'd like to do is, is not to use sort of very um, one-sided ideas like they cannot. Like let's think about Big Pharma. Big Pharma has created three or maybe four types of vaccines, which have had a huge effect on the coronavirus pandemic. So I don't think the idea that they cannot do good is true. If we think about big tech, like Google and Apple, they are historic rivals, they hate each other, yet they have partnered up to make contact tracing systems. And if you think Google doesn't do good for the world, right? how would the world be without Google search, without Google documents, without Google maps? I think they do good. Yes, they do some bad, and the goal of my work is to try to encourage them not to do as much bad. But I don't think that the whole idea that companies are inherently really bad and cannot be fixed is true. We have seen some changes of companies um, genuinely embracing um, purpose. Um, Leandro asks, how can companies contribute to increase access to decent and non-precarious work? I think this is really important. I think part of it is to recognize that even when we have things like technological changes, which sometimes make people um, redundant, to make sure that we engage in them in the most humane way possible. And so this is also linked to one of Nicholas's questions, which is what happens when there are redundancies, wage reductions. So let me give you an example of Airbnb. So within Airbnb, they've realized that because of the pandemic, air tra travel just more generally, is going to go down. And even after the pandemic reverses, people are still going to be traveling less. There's going to be less business travel, for example. So they have had to cut 25% of their workforce, and that's really challenging. But they've tried to make this decision in the most humane way possible. So they've said, I'm going to give all of my workers 14 weeks of severance pay, when I believe in the US, the minimum severance pay is actually zero weeks. They've said, we're going to give everybody one year of health care, why? Because healthcare is really important in the pandemic. They're going to allow everybody to keep their laptop because that's going to help them find a new job. And also it's going to be um, that they're now changing their recruitment department to be an outplacement department, and that will help those people find, find new jobs. So I think that's a way in which you, you, they had to take a difficult decision but took a decision not saying, oh, we don't care about these people anymore because they're no longer with us. Let's try to make sure that this decision is made in the most humane way possible. Now, there's loads of other questions, Andrea. So, like, I, I won't yeah. get them all <laughs> them, <but laughs> If there were any that you thought were particularly... Can I, can I, make, you, can I make you yeah. just, uh, just a question? Sure. To, maybe can help also to smooth uh, the debate because this kind of conversation can... Uh, uh, I don't know, open for a lot of discussion, a lot of different point of views, maybe sometimes a little bit of ideology as well. Mm -hmm. So can you give us some uh, uh, suggestion, for example, to overcome this confirmation bias that I think uh, that is something we can, I mean, we, we all suffer, mm -hmm. we all suffer about. So can, can you give us some some uh, practical suggestion to, I mean, we, maybe not all, not all of us are academics or have the, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the time to work and to delve into all the evidence, the data, the, the paper and whatever. So can you give us some practical suggestion to try to overcome this confirmation bias, please? 
I really like the question, Andrea, and I, I think it's a great, um, a, a important general one. So how to avoid confirmation bias, which is you have just a very strong viewpoint. I try to actively seek other viewpoints that I know I'm going to disagree with. So when we had the Brexit referendum a few years ago, I was a very strong Remainer. I was very strong in staying in the European Union. And I like to think that all the Brexit supporters were xenophobic and racist and, and stupid. But I thought, well, that's unfair for me to do this. Let me attend some talks by Brexit supporters with strong economic and business knowledge. And so I went to those talks and I learned what their arguments were. Now, I didn't agree with all of those arguments, but I stood in their shoes and I thought, OK, one of their arguments seems to be we want to be just as open to trade as before, but this is going to be allow us to, to be as open to non-European companies as European companies. And I, in fact, I wrote on um, my blog the case for Brexit. So even though I was a very strong Remainer, I put the case for Brexit on my blog, obviously alongside my case for Remain. But this was so that anybody who wanted to learn about the Brexit debate in a fair and balanced way, they could see both the arguments for, for and against. And what I'm also going to put in the chat here is um, a little simple guide called um, Evaluating Research. So that's just a cut out and keep guide for a few simple checks that we will undertake when we see a study, just to try to ensure that that study is actually correct, rather than we believe it just because we happen to like, like the findings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for your talk, for your uh, suggestion, for your uh, time and availability. I guess that uh, we all uh, can take some, I think, many insights from your uh, from your lesson today. So uh, I will leave the floor now to Paolo, who is going to present uh, us the next uh, guest, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. And then before you do that, Andrea, I know that there's a load of other questions which I won't have got time to get to. So if you just drop me a note on LinkedIn, well, I, I pledge to get back to people with their questions. I really appreciate people's input. Perfectly. We will do that. Yeah. And also, Professor Edman, uh, we will have you also, we will have the pleasure to have you once more uh, in the F school, perhaps also and then next year, if you want, because uh, really a lot of people are sending us message that they are enthusiastic about this lesson. And uh, no, I really thanks for uh, for the time and for uh, also for your way of presenting ideas very interactive you picked uh, you reacted to questions i mean that's uh, very very interesting and i mean i'm, I'm paulo santori i'm one of the organizer of this school and uh, and i also <laughs> thank you because you were the first who answered us uh, yes i will be part of the economic francesco school and your answer give us give us a lot of you know energy we were very happy you know and uh, we had last, last week Parta Das Gupta. So having Das Gupta and you in, in one week at the F school has been uh, really, really a great pleasure. So my personal thank and also thank to, to Andrea because Andrea took in charge, Andrea Roncella took in charge this webinar organized with the three discussants, Noemi, Kyle and Nicholas, and they all, all also have been great in their way of discussing. So thanks to all. Okay, my role is uh, to announce the next, lesson. The next guest will be Ridi Krishap, and the title of the lesson is Big Data for Good. <laughs> so from, we move from finance as a common good to big data as a common good. Ridi Krishap is a researcher at the University of Oxford in Democ social demography, and uh, she will be like Professor Edmonds, very, very interactive, very, you know, into, into the topic. And also here we at the Economy Francesco School, uh, I mean, sometimes when people look uh, at the economy of Francesco, they say, oh, the, this is the economy of good sentiments, uh, wishful thinking, uh, but actually it's not. We, we, we want to take into account, we want to, to face and deal with complexity. We know that human beings are complex and also systems created by human beings are complex. So we know, everyone knows that big data has, has got a lot of problems. Uh, every one of us has heard in, this in the news. But we now want to, with Ridi Krishap, wants to understand if big data can be used for good. And she will, she will show us that we can use big data to, to help people in the, uh, underdeveloped countries, help them to help themselves, not just to help them. So, I mean, it will be an amazing lesson. We will have Valentina Rotondi back. She's another organizer of the school. So I wait you, it's the 28th of, uh, of May, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so, uh, my, my role now is finished. Professor Edmonds, thank you again for having been with us today. 
I don't know if you want to say something uh, the final for for our community. Yeah, I, I'd say so thank you so much. I, I love being here and, and I'm honoured that you, you're thinking of having me back next year and I, I'd love to do that. And it may well be even in person. So if, if the world get, yes, gets back to normal, exactly. that would be really fun. So I think just to leave what I, I leave you with is I, I, I do think this idea of purpose is, is really, really powerful. So I, I think um, it's something where there's not just the strong moral case, but a business case. And I do think that you are moving with the wind. So yes, there's a lot of change that needs to happen within business before we have the world that everybody wants to see. But I do see even the most skeptical organizations like investment banks and investment management firms, people are moving with it. So it's great that everybody here is really embracing this idea of purpose and finance for the common good. And it's just great to see so many leaders from around the world just taking the subject seriously. And I really appreciate everybody's engagement with, with, with the message. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And so my final thanks, Professor, and I wish you can join me is also to all the people who attended today, because I mean, they took one hour and more of the time to, to attend the webinar. We had people here on Zoom, but also on YouTube. And a lot of people, uh, more than 1000 will see this lesson uh, today. So I mean, uh, to us really our uh, from the organizing committee, our deep, uh, uh, thankful, great, uh, thankful, because we are doing this school for you, for us and for you. And so having you here for us is, uh, is very, very important. I mean, I, I would like to show you my, my gratitude if you pass in Rome here to, to, to buy you a beer or a coffee, whatever. But I mean, that's no. So thank you, everyone. So I ask Lourdes to, to send the sigla and Professor Edman. So we will work together and we will see you soon at the Economy of Francesco. Thank you. Thank you very much.